No one knows what really happened, but there's a legend that on the desk of every member of Congress in 1862, they found a copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. It was the biggest selling book that year. It was the biggest selling book that century. 300,000. The only thing that sold more was the Holy Bible. But the legend is that upon meeting Harry Beecher Stowe, Abraham Lincoln shook hands and said, so, you're the little lady that wrote this book that kicked up all this ruckus. <laughs> Books are a powerful thing, aren't they? The right book can save a life. The right book at the right time. You know, we've been hearing a lot and seeing in the news a lot about things happening in schools, frightening things, haven't we? And some, you know, some people are starting to look at curriculum, anti-bullying curriculum, which the statistics show is working. What guy is using it? And it is, it is really bringing down the level of, of violence against other students. This is nothing new, though, is it? Um, adolescent psychologists have been looking at violence in children's and young adult stories for a long time. And it goes back for centuries. Every culture has monsters and monster slayers uh, in, in their stories for children. And adolescent psychologists like Bruno Bettelheim have said that this is a healthy part of the development of the adolescent subconscious mind. And that's why Grimm's fairy tales and enemy slayer for the Diné, the Navajo Nation, that's why these stories, they're still around and they always will be. As you may know, Catherine Patterson and Chris Crutcher said that we want our young readers to experience some of the bad things about the real world from the safe distance of reading. A study done by Jill Hathaway, a graduate student at Iowa State University, who put young adult novels with shooting incidents in them in classrooms all around Ames, Iowa, found that the students who read this came to understand the sensitivity of relationships among peer groups and noted that oftentimes it was uh, people being picked on and bullied and teased and kind of physically harassed for years and years and years that would lead to this event. Also, they've been trying out a relationship curriculum. Peter Smagorinsky, who was a very famous professor of English education at the University of Georgia, is suggesting that along with math and science and English, and language that we also have a little bit of schooling on getting along with other people. How can I be a good spouse later on? How can I be a good neighbor? How can I be a good member of my community? We've got to take care of each other, don't we? You know what? I was driving along the other day, and I came to a stop stoplight, and these two kids walked in front of the car. And I thought, those look like Tom Levine characters. <laughs> oh my gosh. Tom was the artistic sponsor, coordinator. He was just kind of everything for Kiros Theater for teenagers. And they had indie bands and plays and all sorts of cool things there. For years and years and years, he was watching teenagers and coming to understand them. No one create a more authentic teenage character than Tom Levine can. They're edgy, they're kind of on the fringe, and they're so interesting. They're these teenagers who say, gosh, I wish I had that person in class. I miss being a high school teacher sometimes. And so, without further ado, I introduce to you Tom Levine. Thank you.
can tell because I'm up to you, but I'm not going to lie. Okay. Hey, everybody, how's it going? How's everybody doing? Pretty good? Yeah? yeah. Nodding? Okay. Um, so, question. Somebody started throwing out a favorite band. Favorite band name. Go. Five seconds of summer. I'm saying louder? Five seconds of summer. Five seconds of summer. Any five seconds of summer fans in the room? Raise your hand. Ra raise up. Get him up there. <laughs> okay, somebody else. <laughs> Another band. I don't care. Band, musician, anybody like that guy. What? Fall Out Boy. Fall Out Boy. Hands up. Any Fall Out Boy? Oh, little oh show. Fall Out Boy over here. Very nice. Okay, good. Good. All right, somebody else. Anybody? Another band, musician, somebody like that. Go ahead. The Beatles. Here all day, day. What? The Beatles. The Beatles. The Beatles. Any Beatles fans? There we go. Okay. All right. <laughs> Go ahead and check over here where the seniors are sitting. All right. No, Beatles, good. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Another like musician, band, anything like that? Go ahead. Don't be shy. It's funny how quiet everybody wants. Like I don't want anybody to know. <laughs> Go ahead. One more. Uh, Rise Against. Rise Against. Any Rise Against fans in here? No one's like jumping up, but okay, they're getting their hands up. That's pretty cool. Have you noticed? And nobody said social distortion? What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> like, I wore the shirt, y'all. It was a pretty easy quiz. <laughs> whatever. Uh, but have you ever uh, seen somebody, like maybe on campus or on shop or whatever like that, who's wearing a shirt of your favorite band, right? And there's something that happens in there, you're like, it doesn't matter what mood you're in, it's like, Grr -grr -grr -grr. social D. <laughs> and there's this instant connection, like we could hang out, no matter what the differences might appear to be between us, we could totally hang out if we listen to the same music. I remember uh, a few years ago, I was at the was like Discount Tire or something like that, I was wearing one of my Social D shirts, and the, uh, one of the guys in the back there was doing something, he looks up and then double takes, and sees my shirt and goes, hey. Social D. <laughs> but not buddy, he goes, no, no, no. He rolls up the shirt, he's got this huge skelly tattoo, like, right there. He's like, all right, that's cool, man. And I can't remember, I was doing, I had some kind of work done, and I asked him how much it was gonna be, he's like, no, it's cool, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm like, yeah, Social D! Social D, this is great! So it's such, a, it's such a cool feeling when we have that kind of weird, random connection like that, right? Uh, okay, now I've got the, the worst question ever. Oh, God, brace yourselves, folks. Um, anybody over here? Born before the year 2000? Oh, some of you, okay. 95? Oh, there's still a few, okay, okay. So most of you are, we're looking at what, like that 96 to 2000 era? Okay, not too bad, that'll come in later. That's not as bad as I feared, good. <laughs> um, so I grew up kind of straddling the 80s and the 90s. I'm a Gen X kid and I'm mostly crowded it, you know, and I'm sorry, let me just apologize. I'm sorry for Gen X. It uh, wasn't my fault. <laughs> But I was there, I was definitely there. And some of the things we had that I, that I, don't, I don't think most of you guys will probably remember, but I'm gonna tell you about them because they're, they're so awesome. Like um, America Online Discs would come in the mail and you had to put them in your computer and like plug your phone into them and it would go And then you would be online and you'd go to like chat rooms and chat rooms was such a cool thing. And like the big questions about chat rooms were, is she really naked? And is it really she? You know, we didn't know. So that, that, that's what I heard. That's what I heard. <laughs> Talking about, I'm not really sure. Um, we beat the Soviet Union. We won the Cold War. I mean, USA! USA! We totally did that. That was us. And the Berlin Wall came down. That was us. I was there. No, I wasn't really there. But it did happen. It did happen then. That was pretty cool. Uh, there was all this, and there was sort of a feeling, just personally speaking, up in that era. Um, we had grunge, like that was cool, and I, I haven't grown up yet, apparently. Um, <laughs> but we had that, and, and there was a, one of the bad things about it is when, when grunge happened, if you've seen photos, um, that's how my friends and I dressed anyway. So then Seattle happened, and suddenly our $10 flannels were $90. It was like, what the, no, you can't. And like the football players were wearing them. And I was like, no, you can't, no, oh, what are we supposed to wear now? So it was terrible, but uh, our president and president-elect were like playing sax on late night. That was the coolest thing ever. Like, so it felt like at the time, for me anyway, for my friends, it felt like we had entered this new era. Like everything was gonna be cool. We knew there were problems, there were some issues, but we were gonna take care of it, because it's the 90s. The 80s were over, that was good news. We needed to really, yeah, we had to, they had to go, they had to go. So we, we, and we survived them. We didn't get blown up by nuclear missiles, so that was awesome. We had everything going for us. The 90s were looking, really pretty good, um, and there was almost a sense of, we have the the freedom in the 90s to be all introspective and any better and like check our own self out, you know, because we're the Gen X or whatever. Um, there was a freedom to kind of do that. And then, in April 
of 1999. I went to have some breakfast in my living room or dining or whatever and opened up the newspaper. You guys have newspapers? Stuff? Uh, <laughs> uh, opened up the newspaper and there was a headline about this little town in Colorado. And these two kids had shot up their school and killed several people, mostly students and at least one teacher. And at the time, that was, well, it was a tragedy, okay? Uh, obviously. But the thing about that was, uh, when we use a word like tragedy, it has a, there's kind of a connotation of a tragedy being a one-time thing. It's a one-off. This tragic thing happened, and then we moved on and healed, and, and things you know, went on. Only now, almost 20 years later, it's not just a tragedy anymore, is it? It's this almost daily, certainly monthly, thing that seems to be happening all over the place. Uh, and one of the things that I noticed just recently with uh, the Parkland shooting, uh, and I want to make sure I weigh this and say it carefully, uh, when, if, you, if you've seen photos or video of the news footage of Columbine, all you see is people stricken, like just in absolute shock, terror, weeping, I mean like it, it, it looks like a war zone, right? And then last week, this shooting happens in Parkland and the, the, the glimpses, the glimpses of footage that I got were like, Oh, yeah, probably tell everybody I'm okay. Like, I'm sure, don't get me wrong, I know everybody there was impacted. I know everybody, I'm a PTSD kid myself. I know there's gonna be consequences. I know they were feeling them. But there were these windows of footage where it just looked like it was our turn. Like, that's all it seemed like. That's all uh, it felt like. And that is, I can't even find the word for it. Like, frustrating doesn't seem quite strong enough. Um, terrible, awful, uh, hideous, wrong, I don't know. Um, so, Mercy Rule um, is about, technically speaking, as far as the plot goes, um, is about the days and weeks and months leading up to a school shooting, and it, it is set here in Phoenix. Um, it is a multiple point of view novel. Um, if any of you have read Part A Party fans, we have we, we done Party? We have done Party, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so these, these multiple point of views kind of go throughout the entire story and tell several different stories. And originally, uh, the thing that I kind of wanted to study was uh, when, when I write young adult contemporary fiction, which is what this is, it's because I have a question that I want to answer. And there is, it's not the kind of question you can Google, right? Uh, and I wanted to know what in the hell would make somebody do this? Why, what, what's the motivation? What, why would somebody do something so awful? And in the process of writing from multiple points of view, I came to realize that there are a number of characters in this book who have a quote unquote motive to do something this awful. And the number one thing that I discovered both in writing this and doing the research and in my experience as a writer, uh, what nobody told me when I published my first book back in 2010 is that as a particularly contemporary YA writer, you start getting invited to schools and you do high school visits and stuff like that, and that's cool. It's my favorite thing to do. But almost, I think, my first visit, I think, was at McClintock down the street here, and almost instantly, I discovered that after I would do my book talk, I would have students come up and just start telling me their stories, and here's what's going on in their lives. And I was like, wow, okay. And at first, I didn't even believe most of it. I was like, Pulse, come on, your mom didn't say that. Like, no, she really did. And I get story after story after story of stuff that's really happening, and a lot of those types of things go into this book. Uh, and the through line, the thing that seemed to keep coming back, that I, that I kept coming back to, was the idea of dismissal. In fiction writing, if any of you are any kind of art, if any of you are artists, poets, visual art, photography, novel, whatever, you know, hopefully by now, <laughs> that rejection part of the job. You just, that's what you sign up for and you just take it. And I've got a database full of rejections, full of them. That's just how the industry goes. Uh, being in theater, you get bad reviews. I got nailed by the New, by the, by the new Times, I don't know how many times. <laughs> Um, and they savored it. They loved kicking the shit out of us. It was great. Uh, but okay, that's what you signed up for. It's no big deal. The thing is, rejection, and I don't believe that this is just a matter of semantics. Rejection 
requires a connection. There's some kind of give and take. There's a relationship there. There's almost an intimacy even. Because when I submit my query letter to an agent and she says, no, thank you, not for me, she made contact. She acknowledged that I exist, right? So there's that. It's sad, it's bad news, maybe it hurts a little, it's a bummer. Okay, but there was an acknowledgement. There's something here between two people. That's rejection. Cool. Dismissal? Like, you don't even register. You don't exist. I don't want you to exist, and you make zero impact on my life whatsoever, and I would argue that is far, far more damaging than rejection could ever be. Uh, and the thing that a lot of these characters have in common is that they have been dismissed by teachers, by parents, by churches, by whomever, any kind of group, um, other students, they're being absolutely dismissed. It's this back attorney, you don't even exist to me whatsoever. It sort of robs your soul, right? Um, does anybody know that feeling? You know what I'm thinking? You kind of feel the difference between rejection and dismissal? Yeah. Uh, and that happens, uh, that's one of the things we discuss in the book. Now, interestingly, um, maybe it's not interesting, I don't know. Uh, this is actually a prequel to another book that I wrote but never, uh, or haven't published so far. And that book was, uh, it was called 53rd and 3rd, which is a Ramon song, so I don't know that. And what happens in 53rd and 3rd is there's a, a street corner here, kind of in the Scottsdale, Phoenix area, where every Saturday night all these high school kids come around and they just congregate there and they just hang out on the street corner all night long. And all they do is talk and smoke cigarettes and hang out and whatever, and, it, and it's really cool. And it's all like the nerds and the geeks and the goths and the, you know, whatever other label you want to do. Though, you know, those kids. <laughs> those kids. Um, <laughs> and in the story, one night, one of those kids brings the quote unquote popular girl to the corner because uh, they've been friends this whole time. And he brings her along thinking, all of his friends will be like, oh, cool, somebody new. And instead, the corner kids completely turn on both of them and have this wave of, no, 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 you can't bring her here. That's not fair, this is our place, she doesn't belong. And the whole novel was a study of how easy is it to become the thing that we hate. Uh, so again, that book is not out yet, hasn't been published, but that's the one that would now technically be a sequel to Mercy Rule because some of those characters fall from, uh, go from Mercy Rule into that one. Because it's a good question. How easy is it to become that thing that we hate. Uh, so, we're gonna do something. We're gonna try something. I don't know if it's gonna work. First, I'm gonna get some water. Just like this. Ah, make sure that makes the cut. <laughs> uh, and this is, this is gonna be rough. I worked last night. I don't know if it worked tonight, today. Uh, I would love to ask you guys some questions. And I would love for you to participate. I can't force you. I can guilt you. I can't force you <laughs> into participating. But I just wanna see what happens. Um, so I'm just gonna ask some questions, and I would love for you to raise your hand um, if it applies to you. Okay, be cool. Yeah, you don't have to if you don't want to, but I think it would be really cool. Um, first question: If you or somebody you very, very deeply care about has ever been involved in any kind of serious accident, car accident, accident at work, school, anything like that, would you have the courage, please, to raise your hand for me? Wow, that is way too many accidents. Look around, I just want you to look around. Look at all these hands that are up right now. Wow, that's insane. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate that. Um, if someone you love has been taken from you too soon, and I don't care how you define that, it's up to you. Someone has been taken, you too, taken from you too soon because of cancer, would you raise your hand? Not as many, that's good, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry to see that. Do you see all the hands up, though? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if <laughs> if you've ever been impacted personally by someone else's addiction to whatever, I don't care. Raise your hand. Yeah. Addiction is fun. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Um, this one's gonna be tough. I only got a couple more. This is gonna be tough, though. Um, if you've ever been, whether today or in the past, if you have carried the weight of your own or someone else's, someone you love's uh, mental illness, depression, anxiety, PTSD, body stuff, uh, eating disorder, anything like that, 
Would you have the courage today, please, to raise your hand? Me. That is a lot. That is a lot of us. You guys are awesome. Thank you for doing that. Two more. Uh, this one. Oh, this is my favorite. This is my favorite one. Okay. Uh, if you have uh, probably in your family or if you've ever been impacted by a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia, raise your hand. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't know. You know what? Wrong. I didn't use. I didn't use the scientific term. The scientific term is fucking Alzheimer's. I'm sorry. <laughs> Alzheimer's. Yeah. Because man. Of the things I hate in this world, boy, that is right in the top spot. That is something I would not wish on my worst enemy. Hate that. Thank you for raising your hand. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, last one. Uh, this is rough, but I think we can do it. If you've ever personally experienced any kind of violence, sexual, physical, emotional, verbal, even spiritual, I would take that, would you be willing to raise your hand? God damn. Look around. That is, this is way too goddamn many of us. Way too goddamn many of us, and it's not okay. Thank you guys for doing that. I appreciate that. That is way, way too many of us. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed this, but of all those things that I just asked, none of them, A, were your fault. None of them. There's nothing you could have done. None of it was your fault. Um, I think we can agree, after seeing all those hands go up, that shit happens in the world, right? Shit just happens, and it's not our fault, and we cannot control it. We gotta talk about anything that we can control, right? But it looks like we've got some things in common. It looks like everybody in this room, and I bet you if we gathered some other people from ASU in here, I bet there'd be some other hands going up. Yeah, most likely, statistically. Anybody not raise their hand? Okay, don't, I don't <laughs> uh, Yeah, so if that's true, uh, if, it's, if it's true that there's stuff that we can't control, that there's stuff that happens beyond us and, and we're just kind of stuck dealing with it, then why, why would any of us do anything ever to make it worse, you know? Um, like, do you ever get the feeling, um, maybe it's just me, but like, do you ever wonder, like maybe it's you're watching a nature show or you're out walking around or something like that, do you ever get the sense that like every plant and every animal on Earth is looking at human beings going, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> what are you thinking? You're killing us and you're killing yourself, please stop. Like you can almost, like the planet is just like calling out for it, right? It's, it's, it's palpable. Uh, why would we do anything to make it worse? I don't know. Okay, let me try one more thing. I'm gonna get a little sip here. Follow me, I'm gonna take a sip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try one more thing. Now this time, I don't want anybody to raise their hand and I don't want anybody to say a word, okay? I'm just going to throw some words out there and we're going to see what happens. <clears throat> Ready? Here we go. Donald Trump. Don't say a word. Don't you say it. Hillary Clinton. Gun control. We'll stop there. Now, all I did was throw a couple words, some names and stuff like that. Don't raise your hand. I don't want to know. But I'm willing to bet some of you had a very visceral reaction to those words, to those terms, yeah? Interesting, interesting. In fact, probably some of you even right now are already just pissed <laughs> and glowering, right, that these words and these names came up. But that's kind of weird, because 60 seconds ago, we were all one big family. 60 seconds ago, when we were talking about stuff that we've been through, man, we were ready for a hug. We were all in this thing together. Two, four, six words, and it goes out the window. That's weird. That shift, that shift from, hey, we've got stuff in common, hey, we can work something out together, to anger, to vitriol, to hate, just absolutely springing up from inside of us, that is what this book is about. Because that feeling that we just had when I mentioned just a couple of different words, that feeling, folks, in my estimation, is dismissal. And that's the problem. Now, let me make a couple things clear. This is all opinion, by the way. <laughs> uh, righteous anger. Righteous anger is good. Nothing wrong with righteous anger. Righteous anger is gasoline that we put into engines that make change. Totally on board with that. We absolutely need that but it's not a good way to communicate. 
It's not a good way to move forward. Uh, yeah, that's dismissal. Does that make sense? Did that, did, yeah, that is the dismissal. That is what this book is about. And what I want people to take from this book and from books like it is how can we do things differently now? How can we take that first feeling of, hey, we're all in this together and put that towards making different choices? Uh, there's a, uh, a former pastor named Rob Bell. I don't know if anybody's heard of Rob Bell. He's a great guy. Um, former pastor, now uh, a speaker and author. And he's written some great books. I've had a chance to spend some time with him a couple years ago. Um, really, really cool. He's got a talk, you can probably find it on YouTube, called The Gods Aren't Angry. At the end of this talk, he tells a story about how, as a, as a young pastor, he was just working, 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 struggling, struggling, showing everybody how tough he was and how fast and he could do anything he wanted or whatever, and it was killing him. It was absolutely killing him. I'm guessing there's a few of you in this room who know that feeling. We're going 800 miles an hour and you can't stop, right? It happens in college all the time, high school, same thing. So he goes out to lunch with a friend of his uh, and tells, tells all the stuff that's going on and his friend says, Rob, 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 you don't have to live like this. And Rob Bell says, yeah, no, I know, I know, I know. Tomorrow the sun's gonna come out, everything's gonna be okay, I have a plan, everything will be all right. And his friend says, Rob, you don't have to live like this. No, 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 I get it, I get it. No, I'm gonna do this, and I've got plans, and work. I'm gonna dig myself out of this hole, and everything will be fine. Rob, you don't have to live like this. This one phrase, we don't have to live like this, I can tell you right now, changes things once you let it kind of suffuse your body and your soul, if you believe in that kind of thing. Uh, because I gave up a 25-year addiction to nicotine based on that phrase alone. I don't have to live like this. I don't have to. That was a choice. I don't have to. I don't have to take that next drink. I don't have to say this awful thing to my kid or to this other person, you know what I mean? Those are choices. When we all raised our hands a few minutes ago, again, we were talking about things beyond our control. We can't stop Alzheimer's, at least not yet, right? Hopefully we'll find a way. But we can't stop that. When we have this visceral reaction to politics or to conversations with people that we in general don't like, okay, maybe we can't change that. But we can definitely change how we address it. We can address, we can change how we talk to each other about those things because we're gonna have to or this fucking shit is gonna keep happening. It's gonna keep happening. Uh, I'll, I'll, you know, hopefully by now it's clear. I'm not here today to talk politics because I just get sick in my stomach. <laughs> but to instead talk about what are those first steps? What can I do? Look, I'm not a legislator. I'm not this, I'm not that. I, I'm, just, I'm just, dude, I'm just trying to get my kid off the kindergarten today. For God's sake, that's all I wanna do. Cool. How I get my kid off to kindergarten this morning, I think makes all the difference. How we interact, how I treat him, how my wife and I are training him to treat others, that's where this stuff starts. I'm not asking you to change your opinions, your beliefs, anything like that. I'm asking you to be very considerate and thoughtful about the fact that we don't have to live like this. We don't have to live like this. Um, and I think, I'm gonna stop there. I wanna say this, and I think we'll do some questions if you want. Do you guys have questions, like writing stuff? We'll have some questions in a second, maybe? Yeah. We'll see. Uh, so, before we do that, uh, thank you for having the courage to raise your hands. That was not easy. That was probably the hardest thing you're gonna do today, maybe this week, maybe this year, I don't know. But I appreciate it. And if you take nothing else away from what happened here today in this room, I want you to take home the fact that you rose your, raised your hand and you looked around and you are not alone. You are not the only person who went through or is going through what it is that you raise your hand about. We are here. There are still a lot of us here, okay? May you be happy. May you be well. May you be safe. May you be peaceful and at ease. Thank you guys very much. We'll do some questions. If you want to, or you can be dismissed early. I don't know. Is that a thing? <laughs> That's up to Dr. Um, so, yeah, anybody want to talk about anything? I don't care. Writing stuff, uh, any of the stuff we just talked about, or school, whatever, publishing. I don't care. No. There's one. Hi, young lady in the front. How did you come to publish the prequel before the second book? 
Um, that's a good question. I just never, I never got a good version of the second book that I liked um, because that is also multiple, multiple perspective, and I couldn't make some of the the key characters work. Like I, I tried several different things, and the it was it was a craft issue. I could not craft the book correctly, even though I knew the whole story inside and out. Um, making it gel was tough. I'm curious to see what happens now. Now that I have a Russian rule kind of out in the world, I'm curious if I can then use that to. Uh, to make that work, but I don't know. It just, it fell apart. It happens, it happens all the time. Books fall apart. Those of you who are novelists, get used to it, it's okay. <laughs> Books fall apart, that's what they do. So yeah, it's frustrating. I'll hopefully get there, and we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> did, it, did it fall apart because you thought it fell apart, or was it something you weren't able to uh, get representation for? Oh, no, it was me. It was uh, me. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, yeah, that was not, it never got to the point of representation, I don't think, or pitching to agent or editors at the time. Um, I don't think I even ever showed it to my agent at the time, because, yeah, I couldn't quite <laughs> get that, that kind of push off the cliff there, so, yeah. Yeah, good question. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, other questions? Yes. Um, how do you balance the like wanting to work or the drive to work on versus the days where <laughs> or stretches of time where you don't have the inspiration? How do you balance kind of that professionalism, putting yourself to a task, versus keeping it from becoming a chore or sucking away the passion you really have in the project? Great question. Sometimes it does. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. Sometimes. I mean, the difference is. Pardon me. Uh, when when book number one, when you're working on book number one, it's kind of like, wee! <laughs> I made a book. And everything's just you know, there's little stars and everything, and it's just great. Um, and you, and sometimes you spend like my first, my second novel that was published, Zero, which Doctor B will tell you all about. That's um, my favorite. That's his favorite. Yeah. No one else on the planet has read it, but Doctor B. Um, <laughs> so Zero took 19 years to go from the first draft to hitting bookstore shelves, which is older than the main character by like two years. So it was like, get out of the house, go to school. Um, <laughs> so yeah, 19 years for zero, okay? And, but writing it was like, you yeah, I'm writing a book, this is great. Um, and then I sold Party, which is the first book that came out. Um, and that was like a three or four year process, maybe all together, something like that. And that was like, woo, I'm writing a book. And then as soon as that happens, and Random House calls and says, we're buying your book. He's like, wow, I've made it to the Super Bowl. Like, yeah, when's the next one? I'm sorry, the what? Like, no, the next one, and the one after that, and the one after that. Like, when are those coming? And suddenly you're going from five years, 10 years, 19 years to a year? You better crank that thing out, man. Uh, so there is part of it, there is a, a discipline aspect to it where it's like, I gotta get this book out, and I need to sit down and crank out a thousand words an hour or whatever it is um, to meet these deadlines. Um, that's where the shift from, to me, in my opinion, uh, purely my definition, the shift from writer to author happens. Writers talk about art, authors talk about money. I thought that was the most obnoxious fucking thing I'd ever heard in my life before I published. <laughs> and then as soon as I published, and all the authors circled around me and said, come here, sweet, we'll let you, we'll come on. I was like, we're talking about money now. Um, and this is a job, um, and you can't forget that. That's gonna be true of any of the arts. If this is something you do that you want to get paid for, you just started a small business, whether you've been paid yet or not. And nobody else is gonna tell you that, and it pisses me off, because nobody told me that. Um, once you decide you think money should come to you for something you've created artistically, you start a business. Be thinking in those terms starting right now. Uh, so, to get back to your question, I think there's, a, uh, there's an aspect of compartmentalization um, because I think you, yeah, you have to kind of sequester time for yourself that is just for the creativity because you can't give that up. That's how you got there, right? Uh, but then there's another time where it's like, nope, Go to work, put your big pants on, and let's let's do this. Um, in terms of how to do that, I don't know. That's going to be different for everybody. Um, I will tell you that the whole adage like you have to write every day, bullshit. No, not true. <laughs> not true. Great if you can, and if you do, super. Don't hold yourself to that. Uh, maybe set a word goal or something like that. But this whole you have to work every day, have to write every day. No, 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 not true. Not true at all. Because um, think about it, if you can do, I mean, if you do uh, 250 words a day average, you've got a novel in a year. That's not that much. If you average it out to 250, that's, that's one double spaced page. Anybody can do that. Thousands of people do it every November, right? Um, which is good. And so, yeah, I don't know if I'm answering your question very well, but it's, it's, it's a discipline thing. Um, you have to give yourself room to do both. 
the, uh, the professional part and then the wee. Because <laughs> you can't lose the wee, yeah. you know? And I have, and it sucks if you do. Uh, yeah, it's rough. it's rough. But that's a good question. I hope I, hope I gave you something. Oh, yeah, you did. Really good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you came to my high school like three years ago. Oh my god, how'd I do? It's great. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you talked about uh, Manic's Dream Girl. Oh, I did? Yeah, I did. and party. And okay. then um, you said something about how you got inspiration from driving down the road and seeing like a, a car or something on the side of the road that was like. Yeah, the bus. Yeah, the mm -hmm. bus. And um, I just want to know how you went from Manic to Dream Girl to Mercy Rule. Like, where did you oh. get your inspiration? Wow. Yeah, that's wow. That's a good question. Thank you. What school was that? Uh, Pinnacle High School. Oh, Pinnacle. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'll be Pinnacle. Yeah, Pinnacle's cool. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the transition there. Um, I mean, everything. Strictly speaking. Uh, let's see how it is. Okay. So, two of my novels. Um, are, are horror, basically. That's sick and Hellworld. Hellworld just got a Stoker nomination, by the way. Yay! Stoker. Yeah, I'm so pretty cool. So I've been waiting for this my whole life. That's pretty cool. Uh, so those are definitely horror. They're still technically, they're going to be shelved in YA. I've kind of stopped talking about it in those terms, though, honestly. When people say, what do you write? I'm like, horror. Because I don't want to have this YA thing, in case that's not what they read. Um, but I would still argue that despite Hellworld has monsters and Sick has zombie kind of creatures in it, stuff like that, I would still argue they are still YA contemporary just like this because it's not about the monsters, it's not about the magic, it's not about these fantastic elements, it's about these characters and the changes that they go through and the things that they learn as they go. Uh, so while Manic Pixie Dream Girl, which is couldn't be further from a romance. It is <laughs> not romantic at all, as, as a matter of fact. Um, but it's deeply sort of personal and just angsty as hell. Like the hands down most angsty book I've ever read or written. Um, those elements are still in the fantasy novels um, because of the genre. So I think that yeah, the journey from one to the other is really just a question of what's the what is the, the packaging I want to use to study the thing I want to study and to get the theme across that I want to get? Um, so yeah, for Mercy Roll, I really wanted to get into this. I, I, one of the things that's different about Mercy Roll, for example, is that I write about football players. I've never written about football players before, and if I do, it wasn't in the best light. <laughs> because that's how I grew up. That's, that was a problem. Uh, I mean, in, in junior high, I think, and this is why I hate Dallas, <laughs> like, I've hated the Dallas Cowboys longer than I've liked football. And I've only liked football like for a few years because my wife's a big fan. But in like 7th or 8th grade, I don't remember what year it was, but apparently the, the Cowboys were in the Super Bowl. And you could just be walking down the hall and then like an 8th grader would just stop you dead, grab you by the shoulder and say, Who do you want to win the Super Bowl? I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, Who do you want to win? Like, I don't know. And so they'd be like, and they would just knee you in the crotch and leave you bleeding and then walk off because they could do that because they're eighth graders. So I hated football. <laughs> I hated jocks. Um, but that was a long time ago. And meeting more high school students and learning more about their stories, starting to realize, like in the book, this character, Brady, who's a quarterback, um, from most of the characters' perspective, he's Brady the quarterback and he's got his shit together, man, because he's fucking Brady, you know? I'm all right, that's cool, man. You know, do what he wants, big man on campus. And then you turn to his POV and he's locked out of his house and his mom hasn't been there for days and he has not eaten in 48 hours because no one's taking care of him. That's real shit. That really happens. Um, so the transition, I think, is to trying to learn about more people, different people, and see what else. Because I, uh, like, Manic Pixie was almost an exorcism. Like, I needed to get that out of my system. Uh, and it was totally not autobiographical, just so you know. Uh, totally made that up. Uh, and then move on to, well, what else is out there, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can I answer your question? I could just go and go. <laughs> How are you? Yes, sir! So, um, so what is it about fiction? So you're talking about some really real issues. Yeah, I was talking about really yeah. real issues. Like I think of, uh, I guess, I don't know what you call it, investigative journalism or something, the book Columbine that came out like yes. five years after. Yes, so, so what is it taking these, these very real issues? Are there advantages, disadvantages to exploring them through fiction? Good question. Um, there is some creative nonfiction that I would like to do, although it doesn't tend 
to be around this these topics, it turns out. It's more like horror type stuff, which is what I grew up watching and reading for summer. No, I was just totally left to my own devices. I'm like <laughs> renting like horror movies, like VHS horror movies at the shop down the street and my parents, I don't know where they are, but I'm watching Tourist Trap, like, oh my god, that terrible. <laughs> uh, still have nightmares. Uh, <laughs> The difference, I think, that's a great question, and I think the difference is that um, with with a cre even with creative nonfiction, we're looking at facts, and I would argue that there is a big difference between fact and truth, and I'm more interested in the truth of a story and the truth of a character than in the fact of a character. I think. Um, I've thought about doing some nonfiction along these lines because, it, and some other people have already done it and much better probably than I ever could. There was one called, oh, I lost it, something, to Pert 2.0, which is an older book now. It's probably six or seven years old, maybe more, um, where this guy, he like, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't like pretending to be a student because that would be creepy. Um, but like he sort of embedded in this high school for like two or three years and then wrote a book about it, his experience there. Um, it was fascinating and sad. Um, and that's cool, and I've thought about doing that. I've made some inquiries that direction, but at the end of the day, I'm more interested in story because I think our stories matter. Um, and your stories matter. You should tell them, by the way. You should absolutely tell these stories if you can, if you're ready to. You don't have to, but I encourage you to because we need to have them. We need to have them out there. And you all have these massive computers in your pocket right now that can reach seven billion people. That's cool. <laughs> I didn't have that. You should totally tell those stories. You should absolutely tell those stories. So anyway, yeah, that's why. That answer your question? Yeah, okay. How are we doing on time? Oh, yeah, let's go. Uh, where do characters come from? Where do the characters come from? Not so much like, okay, this person, that person, but what's your process for finding your characters? Um, they, so my background is theater. I did 22 years of theater starting in like eighth grade and then up until my son was born. Um, and at that point you're done with theater. Uh, <laughs> pretty much done with everything, actually, at that point. Um, you know, because you can, oh, never mind. I was going to make fun of Bruce, I won't. Um, <laughs> um, so, so with that background, my the, the number one thing you will hopefully God willing find in all of my books is my dialogue. My dialogue tends to be that's kind of the thing that I'm known for, and it's because of theater. Um, and because I'm a theater kid and sort of a theater nut, uh, I can wander around the house by myself and have conversations with different voices. Okay, I'm creeping you out now. Um, and the dog just watches me like you're insane, you know, whatever. Um, but that's where the stories tend to start. I don't usually start with plot, I usually start with character. Um, Cadence in here, who's this little sassy brat, not, she's not a brat, she's just a little sassy punk girl who like, uh, I think somebody says about her, like the whole world is a Christmas present. Like she just, as soon as she wakes up, she's just, wow, life is good, I love the Ramones, like, which is different for me. Uh, I don't usually write those characters who are that uh, non-cynical. <laughs> uh, but she was a blast to write, and her voice just came out very crystal clear at some point. Where it was, it was a new for me. It was a new idea to have somebody who looked like her and dressed like her. And if you saw her on the street, you'd be like, "Oh, punk," you know, whatever. And then as soon as you talked to her, she's, "Hi, how are you? My name's Katie. It's nice to meet you." You know, and I thought that was fun. Uh, most of my stories, most of my books, come from yes, yeah, from this dialogue that I hear, and I and then I hang out with them for a while, and we see where the story goes from there. Then it becomes. Um, a craft thing. Then that's where the craft part comes in. Now I've got to take this character, because Zero originally was a bunch of people hanging out, having really cool conversations about nothing. Like, well, it looks good. Like, the dialogue is good, but nothing happened. So now we've got to find an engine. Now we've got to put in a plot. You know, there's uh, the craft element that, that comes into play. So I would say the voices first. They talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> like they do. Some of you do it too. What are you laughing at? I know some of you do it too. Doc B told me a writer, so don't pull that shit. <laughs> okay, we have like what? One more question? Are we good? Are we done? I think two more. Questions. Two. All right. Bam, bam. Go ahead. You first. Um, your trailer for the book. Yes. Did you come up with the idea for that, or was that Yes. Good? Okay. So, oh, that reminds me. Okay. Before I answer that, um, this is Wednesday, right? Okay, so every Wednesday at 8 o'clock, I do a Facebook Live. It's at facebook.com slash author Tom Levine, one word, and I go live at 8 o'clock, and we just do kind of this. We just go back and forth, talk about some cool stuff. It's a lot of fun. You should totally be there. Um, and 
I don't remember where else I was going to go with that. Oh, and then you can see the trailer from there. The trailer's also on YouTube. If you YouTube uh, Tumble Bee Mercy Roll, you'll find the trailer. It is a really good trailer. Thank you very much. Um, yes, that, that was my idea. I had that the idea, and it's just, uh, actually that character's supposed to be Cadence, um, and she's just walking around, and she gets a text from uh, somebody that says, don't go to school today. It's like, oh, it's like, oh, why are you ditching? Ha <laughs> ha, you know, whatever. And then the next line is, just don't. And that's it. Um, and that actually came from a real, uh, I don't think it's an exact quote, but that was inspired by a real series of texts that were sent, this is several years ago now, between a student who was going into school to do a shooting and telling his friends not to come. Uh, yeah, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that happened in Columbine too. There was a couple people that they warned ahead of time, they didn't say why, they just said don't go to school. Well, what's going to shut the fuck up, don't go, just don't go. Uh, and actually, there's another, uh, you know, Cecil Castellucci, right? Dr. Yeah, she's here right now. Oh, she is? She's here for Desert Nights Rising. Oh my god, I need to buy her, tell her I need to buy her a beer. Because here's what happened, as we were doing a class, uh, Cecil Castellucci and I, and she mentioned that, it was like in the newspaper, in the reports, that this texting thing had happened. And she said, that would be a great opening for a book. And I was like, it sure would be, can I have it? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, buy me a beer. I'm like, okay, cool, so I need to get Cecil a beer. That's good. Uh, or if you could buy her one for if I don't see her, if you could buy her a beer for me and say that's her Tom. Then I'll pay you back. You, you may have to pass it off to Jason because we're both doing Desert Nights Rising Stars, but I've got to give a presentation in another part of the valley. You'll be there soon. Uh, and so we'll, we'll pass around. Okay, yeah, yeah. Make sure she, make sure she gets a beer. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so that was, yeah, based on a real thing. That's the shit of it. This is all based on real stuff. That's, it, you know, for, for, I mean, this is fiction. It's absolutely fiction. But it's truth. Again, it's that truth versus that kind of thing, right? So, yeah, but that's where, that's where I came from. That's, yeah, thank you for asking. <laughs> okay, last question, yes. All right, so I am currently, like, I'm not a fiction writer. Yeah. I live for poetry, but my dad and I are working on a zombie novel. Good. So that's fun. Yes. But um, <laughs> where we are attempting to write it from multiple points of view, mm -hmm. how do you stop those multiple points of view from sort of becoming the same Person. Yeah, that's a great question. It's not easy to do. Um, do you have any theater background? No. Go get some. Um, <laughs> the thing, and, and the reason, and, and for, for any of you who, who are pursuing any kind of creative writing like that, the thing about uh, theater is, and this happened starting from high school, and then going on, is you're literally, you know, there are points where you'll be on stage, you do your thing, you step backstage, you've got a 20 second costume change, and you're right back, but you better be somebody else, right? And after doing that for 22 years, it gets to be a pretty strong muscle, and it happens sort of automatically. Uh, so without having that benefit, the other thing you can do if you don't want to act, and you don't have to, uh, but is to volunteer for a theater, like whether it's here on campus or off campus or stuff. Just any kind of job where you can be in the rehearsal process and watch actors work because they'll start with their script in hand on day one and they're reading whatever, comparing that to the final performance, it's completely different, right? Obviously. And so watching actors go through that process I think can also help trigger some of the things that, that are different. Um, you should buy my book. <laughs> I've got a book on dialogue that will be very helpful. You can find it on Amazon. Um, but one of the things I talk about in there is actually voice and dialogue is something you can manipulate on purpose um, using word choice, sentence length, word length, uh, how much white space do you use? Uh, do characters go on and on and on and on and on or do they use short choppy sentences? Uh, get a copy of Mercy Rule and sit down with a red pen and start noting how different people say different things. For example, uh, if we take the sentence, uh, I, I woke up and got ready, uh, let's see, what I, I woke up and got ready for I woke up, had breakfast, and walked to school. That's the line. I woke up, had breakfast, and walked to school. Uh, Cadence is going to say, I woke up and got ready and walked to school with an exclamation point. All one sentence, no commas anywhere. Brady is going to say, woke up, period. A, period, walked to school, period. Danny is gonna say, I fucking woke up, had some goddamn breakfast, and walked to goddamn school. Same information conveyed, very different voice. You can manipulate that stuff on purpose, um, and I think probably um, one thing that could help, uh, I'm thinking very technical terms now, is uh, print out the different points of view in their order, so you have, a, you have a document that's just Susan, and a document that's just Danny, and a document that's just Bob, you know what I'm saying? Uh, 
and read through those sequentially and make sure that that voice lines up and then go to the next one and make sure that voice lines up. That way, when you slide them back into order again, it'll be consistent. Does that make sense? So those are a couple things you can do, but you can absolutely do it on purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> it is exactly 420, shall Ooh. we give Mr. Levine a hand?